Hey everybody, it's Triple L coming in to talk about My Hero Academia chapter, let me load it up, 373. My review, my thoughts, my impressions. Guys, this is the second time that I, or not second, sorry, this is the third time I'm recording this video. The first two times, well, video file corrupted, so it didn't really work. I'm a little bit sad because, like, I know this is going to take more than 40 minutes to talk about because both of the videos were more than 40 minutes. No matter how much I optimize it, it's still more than 40 minutes. And it's just because I, I keep finding new and exciting ways to complain. Um, and that's where we are. The good thing is that I'm so beaten down now um, from failing that uh, I shouldn't get too worked up. Uh, if there was one issue with the previous videos, it was that I was very excited talking about them. And you know, when I get excited, I also sound very combative, which I don't really think helps the experience. I think my tone really takes away from a lot when, you know, I try to I try to be fair and c critical and fair. Uh, that's what I want to accomplish. The only reason I criticize as hard as I do is because like I think that's the only, like you could go to other people and you can listen to like hours of like super positive spin on any series. Like, all I can really offer you is, like, a critical look. A lot of times, it might be, like, a little bit too harsh or a little bit too wrong. And uh, I'm saying that because this chapter has one moment that is, like, mm, which I'm going to go very hard on. Like, uh, in both videos, that moment, I ended up talking about it for more than 10 minutes. Because uh, it, it's it's indicative of so many issues in Hero Academia Society, which is important. Um and ultimately, when it comes to this chapter, and when it comes to the whole thing with Shoji and that, this was a compromised run that we were doing. And when you have a compromised run, there's a lot of little things that have to happen. Um, and I think you could say that some aspects of the chapter are convenient. And when it comes down to it, you know, with, with the criticism that I'm, I'm ultimately going to lodge, you know, for every for every like failure, there's a or not for every failure, for every like disagreement, there's a reason behind why it had to happen the way it did. Uh, Horikoshi has he like he's not just having to tell a good story he has to tell a good story within the framework of Shonen Jump and that's fundamentally a very different thing from telling a good and I know that not a lot of fans realize that but the medium of Shonen Jump causes a lot of changes to the DNA of any particular series anyway I just really want to convey that there is a, a level of fairness like if you asked me about my opinions or you question my opinions like the, the guys on the live stream know we could have a really good conversation. I might change my mind. Um, speaking of changing minds, uh, that's a great segue into m how my mind was changed about chapter 372. So uh, let's start off with a correction before we get into 373's content. 372, there is a wonderful commenter, White Despair, who went and told us um, on the live stream that Spinner did not in fact run through the doctors. My disappointment was immense. I had to go back and I had to look like, really? I thought the implication was that Spinner ran through the doctors. And it's like, White Despair told us the reasoning. And it's like, oh shit. It's actually possible that he didn't run through the doctors. And the reason this is important is because this changes everything about the way the chapters should be read. If you had that, if you had that, incor well, not incorrect, possibly incorrect. Because there's like still like some little elements, but I, I really think White Despair is right on this one. Um, it changes a lot, it changes a lot of opinions. It also just to me looks incredibly stupid. I let's calm that down. Let's just very quickly talk about um, this potential mistake, which is actually I say potential because I'm just being careful, but it's like a 99% sure that it was a mistake on my part. Uh, so the critical page is page 11 where you have Kurogiri was transferred to the research wing. Um, so that's like all for one telling Spinner what to do. All the elements were here. Ganon, this guy, I'm going to call him Ganon. He looks to the to his left, right? And after that, we have the inpatient ward sign. And we see the doctors all standing a united front. This is a really great image. They're all overworked. Uh, they're staring down the face of possible destruction they're saying you will not pass pretty much right and after that we transition to spinner right i look at this i see the elements of the idea being that hey spinner didn't go to the inpatient ward because he's going to the research wing the elements are there i look back at this page and i ask myself 
if I read this again, would I have said that Spinner ran through the doctors? Yes, I would have. And that's very simply because I'm stupid. Um, when I read Research Wing and Inpatient Ward, my mind is thinking like, oh, you know, maybe you could access the Research Wing from the Inpatient Ward. I don't know, like, Central Hospital's layout. Like, maybe. May I Crazier things have happened. Um, so I look at that, and I'm just thinking, this just makes the comments about the previous chapter being rushed even more salient because like white despair told us that he had a lot of fun telling people that hey actually spinner did not run through those people most likely um so given that he had to say that this was a popular opinion yeah when i look at this i would think yeah no i would still think that spinner ran through the people even though it makes sense that the research wing and the impatient word are different places i would be thinking like spinner's an idiot how would he he doesn't know how to read signs anymore he can barely form a thought unless, like, uh, like uh, you know, it kind of fluctuates. But I, I don't know. He looks he looks rabid. Why would I think he can form a thought? He might just see pins. And he might just want to, like, roll them over because he's like a bowling ball, right? Like, it's that kind of thinking. Anyway, in the reality where, this, where the doctors didn't get run over, it makes everything else just look stupid. Because it's like, so these guys just saw a bunch of doctors standing menacingly. And that was it. That was the moment where they dropped their... Um, where they dropped their weapons. And it's like, Horikoshi goes out of his way to say that they were even more fired up than before. Like, quite literally a page before this situation. Someone shot at them. That's how fired up they were. Like, that would galvanize anyone. And then, you know, like, Shoji made a big deal about what are you going to do when you get to the hospital, huh? What's your plan for those doctors, huh? Well, I could tell you. The plan is, Spinner's going to completely ignore them, apparently. And run into the building so you don't have to worry like you're wow spinner did not commit a war crime he did not target the doctors you know and this ultimately brings me to like the main crux of this whole situation in this in this particular instance is um a, a lot of times the, like the disagreements for a lot of arguments on um like any series ultimately comes down to like how much a reader is willing to accept from an author it's like this is a suspension of disbelief like at the end of the day, if someone cannot suspend their disbelief for a particular segment, that's it. There's, there's really nothing you can do. And what I'm trying to say is that when Horikoshi tells me that these people stopped what they were doing because they saw a bunch of overworked doctors staring at them menacingly, I say, no, I don't believe you. No, 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 I don't believe you. No, 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 no. And mind you, in chapter 373, you see a lot more plot conveniences, which aren't inherently bad um, because you can understand why they're happening. And I'll point them out as we go there. But like, no, 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 no. I disagree. I don't believe you. I don't believe for one second that a bunch of doctors staring would stop galvanized people who were radicalized. Ganon ran, sprinted to keep up with superpowered uh, uh, Spinner. These are people who are willing to attack kids. These are people who in the very next chapter, someone was about to hit Choji on the head with what looked like to be a metal axe. So, no. No. I, I, I fundamentally don't agree. That's my bias. Um, for the readers and for the people listening to the video, you're not going to change my opinion on this one at all. Uh, but there's nothing wrong with that. It's just like that's where I... Like, no, I just don't believe it. Um... Now, does that say that Hero Academia is terrible? No, not at all. Because, um, like, what's really happening here is that Horikoshi went broad strokes idealism. Like, he went for a really idealistic thing. I feel like he wanted his cake and he wanted to eat it too. That's the phrase that keeps coming back to my mind. He just wanted that. Um, and he ultimately goes with broad strokes idealism. You see it in the chapter, broad strokes idealism. Um, and this leads to, like, another big topic with Hero Academia. There's not a problem with being idealistic there's not a problem with like wrapping up things in a, a quick solution there is a problem however specifically in hero academia where hero academia's backstory is rich and full of nuance like when you're told about the past in hero academia you end up you end up with like these really complicated situations with the villains you end up with really complicated situations for like people like nagant you end up with really complicated like heck even in this chapter or in this little thing we find out that there were uh order 66 and uh the great jedi purge or whatever right you have all these little details oh uh, court counseling you f you have so many of these rich little elements that paint um a really nuanced stage 
And then you get into these parts where you just have these sweeping waves of idealism. And the funny thing is that Horikoshi himself can't even prevent himself from writing the nuance and he still slips in the nuance. Um, so that's like one of the big issues here. The reason I don't believe it is because in the rich world of Hero Academia, there is no way that that group of people just stop because they saw a bunch of doctors who didn't even get run over in that reality. Like, because there's a 1% chance that Spinner did actually run them through, but neither here nor there. Um, and this leads to like a, actually a bigger situation um, when it comes to Shonen Jump um, that you really got to... You really have to be kind to the authors in this particular situation. A lot of times people say that any convenient plot development is bad writing. It, it really depends on the context. Um, because the reality is a convenient plot maneuver, the value of it is it's easy to understand. You fundamentally understand it. People understand it so well that they complain about it. And it saves time. And the time factor is probably one of the most important things, especially for this uh, segment of your academia horikoshi cannot spend time away from izuku it doesn't work it's very dangerous for him to do this um historically we know he cannot do this um so when you have this kind of situation he this situation deserves a lot of nuance he can't do it because this isn't what the readers enjoy and we know that because we see people complaining about it we know like this isn't like we know that because shoji has been shafted for the last couple of years even though the author kept saying that he was doing his best in the background he can't spend that much time here and that's why in the previous chapter you see that hey we're gonna do coda we're gonna we're going to also get the, like, the, the we're going to get the present mic stuff we're going to shove in four different perspectives because we need to like get this stuff wrapped up right um, so when it comes to Horikoshi here, you have a rich foundation. It requires a lot of nuance. When you get into the story itself, though, there is a limit to how much can be shown because there is limited screen time, and you have to show it simply to the audience through about 14 or 15 pages. There's just not much you can do in those settings. And then you have to remember this is a battle shonen. A lot of times, your conflicts need to be resolved by hitting people. That's like the fundamental nature of battle shonen. So you have to simplify the problems to a big degree such that when you come into a chapter like this, you end up resolving a so you end up coming to a solution that also includes having 15,000 people suddenly stop even though the people at the back are like nine okay, they're nine buildings away, I'm going to say four blocks away from the hospital and they stop. It's like you know, if, if Horikoshi came in and said that Central Hospital spread a virus that only affects mutant shapes and makes them docile. If, if he comes out and says that next chapter and it spread, like it hyper spread, I'd be like, okay, okay, you know what? Everything makes sense. But uh, that's where you see the convenience. It's when that crowd of 15,000 people stops um, because of uh, something that happened at the, at the very beginning of the crowd. That's ridiculous. You can't have a situation where you say they're fired up and then you go into that, right? That's like the epitome of plot convenience. But again, the value is you don't have to spend any more time calming people down. You don't have to spend any more time with Shoji. You can move on. So that is ultimately the crux of the matter. And that's ultimately what Hero Academia is fighting against. Because Hero Academia makes such a big deal of these nuanced situations, having any solution that is anything less than nuanced or anything that, that's too sweeping, too idealistic just doesn't work and that's where you can really see the cracks form in Hero Academia's um, rhetoric a lot of times and couple that with the rushing and then you're going to see a lot more problems which make things way more interesting to talk about now let's continue talking about you know because we're pretty much wrapping up this whole situation here um, Horikoshi can't spend any more time on Shoji because he has to cover the other battlefields before we go back to Izuku and all that kind of stuff. I don't know what he's going to do. It's because, like, you know, one of the big logistical challenges is, like, if you have to do the other battlefields, it's like, you're going to spend a lot of time away from Izuku. And this one was already four chapters. Like, what is Horikoshi going to do here? Uh, we'll have to see for next week, or I guess this week. I did see spoilers are out. I haven't read them yet, but hopefully they're fun. I hope we continue on uh, the Shoji battlefield. But uh, I'll have a spoiler video out as well as soon as I edit this one and uh, upload it. Uh, so they'll probably, they'll probably both come up at the same time. Anyway, um, going back to this, Shoji. So I'm really sad. You know, like, I feel like this mini arc is a reflection of Shoji's character throughout the story and the way he's treated by the author. Even, I, I find it unfortunate that even in his own arc, 
Shoji's flashback is told through Koda's recalling of Shoji sharing his flashback. You know, you might think like, but you know, you still get the information trip, but like, it changes the uh, the momentum of the chapter. It changes everything because it's like, it's not really Shoji telling us the story. It's Koda remembering it. It's a different framing device. It makes a little bit of an impact. Um, and it shows a bias for Shoji. Shoji, one thing I do love is that Shoji, you're, you ultimately find out that he is Buddha. He is the ultimate. He is the most enlightened creature in all of Class 1A. Um, I, I love knowing that. That's cool. But I kind of wish we got more. I, you know, I'm sad. I, I wanted more from Shoji. And like the things that the author is doing, it's like, author, don't disrespect him like that. You're saying like there's some lines there that's just you're saying that to make it look like Shoji did more than he did. But not really. The real heroes here are Central Hospital and they're like overworked staff that are really good at menacing stairs. It's really them. And you can say like, oh, but you know, the author makes it clear that Shoji um, helped. Like Shoji's words ultimately um, were able to get the crowd closer so that Central Hospital's menacing stairs would be able to like finally put them down. And I'm thinking like, no, no, see, that's ridiculous. These guys just like ran through a building that Spinner broke down. Like the other people... It was Shoji, who was apparently like getting through to people, was about to get his head cut off, or like something was about to hit his head hard. Um, looks like an axe, and you're saying that that like Shoji was able to do anything about these people? No, no, that's a lie. That's 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 not correct. Yeah, you know the author wants to say that Shoji was able to influence everything, and I I you know I I accept the idea, but like looking at it right there. That's not the reality that I'm seeing fully presented. Again, though, uh, let's make it clear. I agree that Shoji, his words ultimately like started chipping away at them. Because you can kind of see that maybe the guy looks panicked when he's about to hit Shoji. But at the end of the day, like he's about to hit Shoji. Anyway, I just feel like Shoji did not get the best. I feel like the author had too many other people that had to get stuff set up. And he had to do other plots in there as well. And I feel like that because of that, you ultimately stepped away from Shoji. Uh, you know, the question is like, how do you improve this? Um, because I, I, when we began this, we came into it knowing that there was going to be a lot of compromises and narrative shortcuts. I think he will have learned that you do some of the heavy lifting at the beginning of the series and then you answer it at the end so that you don't have these kind of big rushes with code and all that kind of stuff. Um, in terms of like, what do you do when you have a really nuanced foundation, a nuanced backstory... Uh, what do you do when you have to try and wrap it up? Well, he, really what you should do is not do anything as drastic as say that 15,000 people suddenly stopped moving because of something that happened at the, at the start of the crowd. That's ridiculous. You can tell what's happening, but like that's a little bit logistically rid ridiculous. Probably I would say leave it a little bit more open-ended. Like you kind of see that he does that with Shoji's words about like make the bigots ashamed of their cruelty and that kind of stuff and that's very fair uh, you pretty much you want to like avoid rushing into a wrap-up you want to show that hey you know this is just the first step there's more work to be done um, really you want to avoid being in a situation where you have to suddenly bring up the fact that there was a Jedi purge and order 66 uh, you you want to be away from that situation you don't want to suddenly bring that up because uh, it makes everything look tacky and it just kind of you know, it helps the idea that there's a nuanced backstory, but then when you're going in and you're trying to, like, clean everything up, the rushing will... It's just jarring. It's just ultimately jarring. We talk about symmetry sometimes. Uh, the symmetry here is... There's such a lack of it that it makes everything very jarring, uh, which is just rough. Um, now, other things. There's still a lot of general notes we have to cover, and this is going to be my favorite point. It's going to be probably 10 minutes. I'll see if I can cut it down. There is a hero that goes in and apologizes... He says, we've heard your voices loud and clear today. Sorry for not realizing sooner. The a good, I think a good chunk of readers going to be like, oh, that's really nice. Oh, that's good. That's good. Um, you're apologizing. And, you know, on the surface level, it's like, oh, yeah, that's, this is actually like really, really nice. Oh, I don't like this angle. Uh, this is actually really, really nice. Uh, uh, at least he apologizes. No. See? This is the problem. Surface level doesn't work in Hero Academia. It never works in Hero Academia. Every situation is way too complicated. When that hero apologizes, 
you know what I see? Idiocy, generalizations, ignorance, arrogance. That's what I see when I'm looking at that hero's apology. Now, mind you, I am going to be arguing very aggressively here. Like maybe the idea here is you take the surface level and just move on. But this is where we're, we're talking specifically about the problems that happen when you're rushing through a story. This is one of the problems. And you know, everything would be better if he didn't have him apologize with the guy that Coda is taking right next to him. And I bet there's a lot of arguments you can, counter arguments you can make to counter my points. I can ultimately beat those points, I'm pretty sure, because real life's on my side. Anyway, let's get into this. We've heard your voices loud and clear today. Sorry for not realizing sooner. This is him saying like, hey man, you know, I really heard you today. And you know, we live in a society where your kids being disfigured and you most likely being disfigured in your childhood is so common that it gets into our textbooks. Our children read about these situations in the countryside where kids are still, that's a critical word, still made to um, bear the scars uh, by these other people. Uh, so yeah, you know, it's in our textbooks. I'm so sorry for not taking that seriously. I'm so sorry for not realizing sooner. What's happening here is actually something that happens in real life too. A lot of times, things are written about in textbooks and people don't really realize how serious something is until they are personally impacted. It's not until someone comes at you with an ax that you realize like, huh, you know what? Your kid's being disfigured? That probably really affected you, huh? Shit. We even wrote about it in our textbooks. Shit. Wow, sorry, man. I didn't realize. Come off it. That's arrogant. That's arrogant. That's ignorant. Come on. It's in your textbooks. Bro, what do you mean you don't realize it? And here's the reality. See how easily he just did that? He just like say like, oh yeah, I didn't realize it even though everyone talks about it in our textbooks. That's, the, that's indicative of society. The heroes know about this problem. They're not going to go help. No, they're going to stay in their cities. They're going to be like, oh, there's more stuff happening here. Um, the agencies aren't going to help because they want money. We know how Hero Academia Society works. Uh, so that's like the first big issue on that one. Here's the other thing. This hero, when he goes in and he apologizes to the PLF member, he pretty much generalizes all of the mutant shapes into one group. He's looking at the group and not the identity. Now, mind you, there's value in saying like, hey, I'm sorry that you are a victim, but let's remember who he's apologizing to. In the previous page, the PLF leader said, that stupid octopus has become a real thorn in our side. Right when we managed to radicalize their passion into a mighty meat shield, that passion and fervor was meant to bring about our supremacy. Do you think this is someone that needs to be apologized to? You just apologized to someone who willingly took advantage of people's wounds to mobilize them into an army. You just apologized to someone who sees them as a meat shield, who was ready to use civilians as meat shields for their cause. You're apologizing to a radical. Now again, there's value in that surface level apology, but this is this not rude to every other victim in this situation? Did you just assume that all these guys are the same because they all happen to be mutant shapes who were victimized? No, no, no. There is a limit here, man. Like, this is a victim that's gone on to make other victims happily. He looks at other people with this disdain. He looks at his own people with disdain. This isn't a martyr. This is a hardcore revolutionary. And now, here's where we come into the nuance on the situation. Horikoshi knows this. Horikoshi, when he writes the PLF member's last little bit there, when he gives us that monologue, he's doing that because he wants to make something clear. He wants to make it clear that people like Ganon are not like this guy. This guy is indicative of the problem. And here's where we have another little bit of nuance that I'm going to touch on really quickly. We see that the PLF is still active here. The girl, which I thought she has a really good design. I'm kind of sad that she's such a radical. Um, she's yelling at the people who have suddenly stopped for no reason because 15 people at the, at the top of the crowd came out of the hospital, right? She's yelling at people. And that just shows you that you're apologizing to these guys, but these guys are not a group. There are criminal elements in that group. There are people who are there to take advantage of the situation. There are people there who are there only to hurt other people. And you're apologizing to them 
as if they're like one identity. They're they're not. They're not. And now you might say like, okay, what else could be the problems of a of apologizing someone like that? It depends on the precedent set. What happens if the PLF member or the leader, he's pretty much at this point, you can say he's an expert at manipulating people. He knows what to do. If you go in and you apologize to these people and you forgive them, what's to stop the PLF member and the other villains in the crowd who are like getting by in the chaos? What's to stop them from taking advantage of that goodwill, getting past the fact that, or, you know, taking advantage of the fact that someone just generalized them, taking advantage of that and then regrouping and then coming back and hitting harder. This is how you continue creating problems. By not properly seeing people as individuals, you allow little things to slip by the cracks, especially when you do a broad strokes thing, and you ultimately give them an opportunity to make things worse again later. Like, heck, I'm actually kind of hoping that we see some PLF members that were here escape and go on and cause more problems because the main problem isn't solved here. You haven't heard anything loud and clear. If you heard something loud and clear, you would have been able to see that this guy is a problem. He's a manipulator for his own cause. He is going to hurt the people who have been wounded here. So when he says, sorry for not realizing sooner, way to go. You've realized nothing. You've realized nothing. You actually got taken in. Actually, you can say you got so manipulated. You believe that this guy is just a person who is wounded and angry like the others. Yeah, no, way to show that nothing has changed. Um, that's pretty much the rundown for this particular situation. It's actually terrible. Um, it makes sense, like, in an idealistic world, but with the nuance of Hero Academia, like, the framing of this particular apology has way too many problems. Um, it cannot be acceptable in any uh, which way. In the real world, this kind of apologizing, apologizing to a group without evaluating the individuals within the group, that's a recipe for destruction. Now, mind you, I also mentioned the PLF member that was still moving. Um, and this is like having to do with my other bits of that I mentioned about like, there's still some nuance here. It's just like, there's also a lot of idealism coming into it. Anyway, at the end of the day, you know, what we're seeing here, we're seeing it because like Horikoshi has to move on. So like, he has to kind of sweep some stuff under the rug and he has to like, make things a little bit more tidy, a little bit more convenient. But that approach does show, you know, it it, it 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 pretty much leaves too many um, openings for Horikoshi. But mind you, he might cover them er, uh, later. And at that point, I do need to get in to chapter 373. Now, I've done this video two times before. I can tell you the page-by-page -page walkthrough will be done around 48 minutes, maybe. Okay, so, page two. So, page two is a variation of Horikoshi's flashback strategy. Instead, this time, he's only flashing back to what present Mike did. And now, here's where you see, again, Horikoshi's paranoia, right? He does want to cover up the holes. Again, he can, even though he wants to simplify a lot, he just can't bring himself to not fill in information when he has the opportunity to. He's very compulsive in that regard. So he tells us, oh, guys, hey, this is the story of how President Mike ended up in the hospital because I know last time it's like he comes out of nowhere. Like, what exactly happening? Or what exactly happened? So we know that I'm going after Spinner at the hospital. Cool. So that's how he gets there. Um, and then we find out, stay here and do whatever it takes to keep them all out. This line is critical because it justifies why President Mike was saying like, oh, Shoji probably got through to them. Now, what's critical to see here is that this is propaganda. Um, Shoji did not get through to the people that got into the hospital with Spinner. Those people were affected ultimately by the uh, central hospital deaths there. But you could say that you know, they were able to keep people out from the entrance. And, you know, it's very, I do wonder how many people were helping at that final moment. Also, the PLF member, here's the weird thing. The PLF member should be far away from the hospital, but I'm going to assume that Coda, Coda and his birds brought him closer so that he could grab him there. Like, not going to bring up too many issues there. Anyway, that page is just there to justify, like, why President Mike thought what he did. And it just ultimately says, like, nah, Sh Shoji didn't actually get through to them. Um, you have to remember that. That line from the previous chapter, jettison it into the atmosphere. It didn't happen. Shoji never got through to anyone. The people that got through the people were Central Hospital and the guys that they converted with their super virus. 
Oh my god, I hope there's a super virus that changes people's cognition. Anyway, at the bottom of page 3, you see one of the people that Shoji did not get through to come at him with what really looks like a piece of metal in the shape of an axe. Um, on page 4, you see that Ganon is trying to stop him. You can kind of see some blood there, so I'm assuming it's pretty sharp. Anyway, Ganon's trying to stop him, and he's looking at the people like he's super terrified. Um, now here, I gotta say that I do like the way that Horikoshi wrote um, Ganon and his people. I do think it's funny that he picked Ganon at the end of the day. But you have really good lines here. Like, hey, I, I think maybe we are using our anger the wrong way. You have good lines and you have a good image here on the PLF leader telling people to not cower and to like, continue going on. Um, at that point, you don't really have to dissect his his dialogue anymore because like he's just propaganda at this point. He's just repeating uh, previous notions. You have Ganon establishing his case here. And then you have page six, where you see a bunch of people, you know, like the, the wonderful thing about the mutant shapes is that they're a hive mind, right? Like when one person sees a doctor and gets scared by them, they all kind of do. They all share the same mentality, right? Uh, they don't actually, they don't actually think for themselves. It's why they can be so manipulated. I'm not sure if you can tell, but like I'm, I'm, be, I'm poking fun at this. Uh, but yeah, no, they all come out of the hospital like they just got hit by Conqueror's Hockey, all right? We already covered why I don't believe in that at all, but the lines here are really good. Um, are you going to laugh at me for being so indecisive? That's actually really, really good. That's a really good line. It reminds me a lot of how people make fun of fence sitters or people who are like, they remind me of like the people who whenever a controversy comes up, they try and wait for the information uh, because they don't want to make a decision on any which point. People make fun of them, but that's like the way to go, right? You know, you know the effect. It happens more in politics, but... You know the effect. I actually really like that line because it's like, yeah, people would laugh, people would laugh at him for being indecisive. Um, he talks about why he did the things he did. You know, you understand where the anger is coming from. Uh, you have page seven. So what Horikoshi is doing here when he says, uh, when he reminds us of the don't care, is because that don't care was a really critical moment there. Um, and it's just saying like, yeah, you know, the little things that were happening earlier, they all kind of played a role here. And that's where you bring Shoji back in. Like, what Shoji was doing earlier, it all kind of plays a role here. But like again, sh uh, but also Spinner's words in this situation. You have him finally questioning the stuff that's going on. And you have him confirming, I couldn't bring myself to hurt the folks in that hospital. And this is where, again, things break down because of the rushing. And there's this thing that people do um, in situations which doesn't really make sense if you think about it, but also people are illogical, so that's why his stories get a pass, but we'll talk about it here. He couldn't bring himself to hurt the folks in that hospital, right? Okay, so that's that's where you draw the line. Good thing Spinner is just going to the seemingly abandoned research wing, and the the abandoned nature of the research wing is also, in, you know, it, it gets called into question. Anyway, he couldn't bring himself to hurt the folks in the hospital. He ignores that Spinner uh, ignored them, most likely. And then you have to wonder, well, like, okay, you couldn't bring yourself to hurt the people in that hospital, right? But Spinner is going to continue doing his thing. And Spinner could hurt people in that hospital. So you were able to keep up with Spinner. You don't feel like you guys could maybe grab him and, like, stop him. Now, see, there's like the big thing here, right? It's they they go they go halfway there, and I want to be very clear. I'm not going to criticize them because like they're victims. Like I'm not actually thinking they're going to be thinking straight, but it is funny that they're worried about hurting people in in the hospital. But at the end of at the end of the day, they didn't stop Spinner. And it's funny that we talk about inaction earlier because it's like your inaction is going to potentially endanger the people in the hospital. But I have more on that point later. Um, so while he's having a speech, Spinner is quite literally possibly winning the war for the villains. Right? Um, so it's just really funny how that kind of works out. Anyway, uh, in the middle part of page 7, you have um, PLF guy. We see his internal monologue. And again, the big ju juxtaposition here is the author wants to make sure that the reader understands there's two kind of people here. There's the villain, the clear villain who would who would willingly use the other person, the clear victim. These people, actually, uh, I won't talk about that because Shoji has a really good line about this later on. Anyway, at the bottom of page seven, you have that shot with the other PLF leader. This is just Hody showing it again that, oh yeah, you know, the people who stopped are the people who don't want to do this, but the people who are going forward are still the PLF guys. These are the designated bad guys here. 
I, I, I do like how she says this is a revolution. It really just reminds you they're doing, like, they're fighting for a bigger cause. Um, that being, they have other motives. Anyway, um, you have Ganon ultimately saying, was I really wrong about all this? Should I have kept, sat at home and kept quiet? Now, this is where Shoji comes in like a freaking Buddha, all right? He says, the feelings that made you rise up today were neither useless nor wrong. This is so, so great. In the same page where you have possibly the worst line in the entire arc, you have an amazing line. When he goes in there, look at what he's saying. He never passes judgment on the action. He says, the feelings that made you rise up were not wrong. They were not useless. All right. But the actions, the actions are objective, objectively wrong. Like, it would be nice if you did this on another day when Japan isn't experiencing an apocalypse. Because now, Kurogiri might get out and shit might go to the gutter. Like, you're worried about your, you're worried about your kids? Well, the guy that you guys ended up helping has a history of having a giant run through cities and most likely killing many children. So that's uh, the big thing here. The feel like Shoji was that was that was a very good line. I really hope this is what is there in the original writing. The feelings are, you know, you can't really no one's wrong for being hurt. But going out of your way to hurt people like that's actually still up in the air. Um, I really like what uh, Shoji did there. Um, on this page, I also have to bring up something that uh, commenter White Despair brought up and White Despair brought up a lot of points in the recent run. Um, specifically the lights. You know, when this all started, I thought the nine lights meant something. But now I'm really questioning it. And we see the light metaphor here. And like, you know, we've had this metaphor before of light representing a bunch of people coming together for a common goal. We saw it in Night Eyes arc. That's like one of the big times that we saw it. And now I'm thinking like, Spinner's pretty much one, maybe. Um, and I just don't see how all for one crying is going to give him a second wind i don't see how that connection is going to reach here so what i'm really thinking i think white despair said that maybe the lights were a metaphor and nothing else and i'm thinking like yeah shit maybe because it's just i like i i thought the lights would make sense in a case where spinner's losing he's not losing in this particular situation shoji didn't uh, unfortunately shoji did not have enough stopping power to make spinner lose so yeah no um I think White Despair might be right. I think he, uh, I think the lights might be a metaphor. Anyway, uh, you have Shoji going in with a very idealistic thing of let, let's use that light to change those who inflict harm and make them ashamed of their cruelty. I think that's a really nice idea, but, you know, like, I think they'll get a lot of people down, but I, I don't think idiots are going to ever stop existing. Anyway, you have Rocklock commenting about the, fe uh, the fervor, sorry. Um, and the reason that he brings that up is because that's, the, that's uh, setting up the panel where Rocklock shows that somehow everyone has stopped. And again, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I count eight buildings, so I'm going to assume four blocks. I would love to know how the heck the people at the back were able to stop. So that's like the biggest bout of idealism. On the bottom of page nine, though, we have a pretty rough line, which is like, Horikoshi trying to like say something but logistically it doesn't make sense and like he he downplays what the heroes did here so Rocklock says all we could do to defend ourselves was fight fire with fire and like the point of that line is to say like there was another way here we didn't have to fight them but it's like bro are you kidding me it took 20 of them seeing overworked doctors to stop doing what they were doing you had like what 200 people versus 15,000 and they were also able to restrain a lot of people without hurting them too badly there's a lot of people arrested no 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 like let's let's not let's not rake yourself over the coals here there's there's practicality here you have 15,000 people who aren't willing to listen to you shoji was trying to speak to them the entire time and he almost got his head chopped off with a piece with a, okay i'm not going to say an axe a piece of metal like that's not fair that line isn't fair like Horikoshi is trying to make a big statement here, but you're like completely invalidating how much they were able to do without resorting to the gun. The gun comes in like at the very last moment when the fervor has gotten too high, right? Um, this has to be respected to some degree. Like let's not let's not say as if 
just talking was going to get you the victory here. No, you had to stop these people to be able to talk to them because they weren't listening otherwise. Let's be, let's be clear here. Talking was, the, was not the final solution. Overworked doctors with a menacing death stare was. Um, on page 9, this is a, another important part that reminds you that uh, the previous chapter was rushed. In page 9, we see that we are in this research wing and we find out that this hallway actually does have doors. Because like when you're looking at the spinner one in the previous one, it's like, why, why is there just a hallway with no doors here? But no, it's actually, there are doors. It's just like spinners in another tunnel beyond this hallway, which is like, it's still like, oh, I just, oh, it just bothers me so much. In what world do you have a situation where doctors are working, they're walking or, sp there's a tunnel where you can sprint down it. Why would doctors walk through that every day? It's such a dumb tunnel. Oh, I'm so bothered. And so bothered. Also, Spinner broke through there. Like, everything was destroyed. And it's like, you could have killed Kurugiri, Spinner. Like, holy shit, man. It just bothers me so much. Anyway, you know, it might have been an art error. Um, there might have been more detail there the entire time. But holy cow, she just didn't have time to draw it. But it's just like, it reminds you, it's, it's rushed. Um, on page 10, we see that Spinner got ahead of President Mike for some reason. And you have uh, President Mike blasting Spinner. All right, so President Mike, in a way, has more stopping power, but like honestly, Spinner's probably a little bit tired. Um, and on this panel, we see that Spinner drops his voice recorder, and he drops something else, a hand. And I'm just wondering, like, bro, where was that hand such that a blast of sound could blow that hand so close to Kurugiri's body, right? That, that's what I'm really wondering. Um, but yeah, you know, conveniences, conveniences. Um, it actually does make sense to me that Spinner would keep that hand. I actually, like, if you think about it, he puts it on Shigaraki, then he pretty much takes it back away from Shigaraki, and then he puts it in, it in his pants. Okay, you know, like, maybe maybe it doesn't really make sense, but, like, okay, whatever. Spinner has the hand. Um, one of the things I found really funny here is that the recording, uh, and he specifically says, without all for one of Shigaraki's voice, I'm just thinking, like, okay, whose voice exactly is on that recording? Is it all for one or Shigaraki's? Or is it both? Like, is the zero zero mark all for one's voice? And then do you have, like, Shigaraki's voice at the two-minute mark? Because, it, like, mind you, if he does, I think that's actually pretty clever. I think that it's probably best to double up on that one. Because uh, you never really know with uh, Kurugiri here. I just found that funny. And I think that's just the author reminding readers, like, hey, guys, like... Just got to remember this is what the activation conditions are. Anyway, uh, you go into the bottom of page 11. Um... And I think, I think the whole bit with President Mike talking about like I gotta be ready to take down uh, Kurogiri because like I can't afford you to like to make Aizawa think of bad times. I think is really cool. Um, and I like ultimately the setup with Spinner with him saying he wanted to follow Shigaraki until he could stand tall. I like that. I I like that. You know, it's answering Spinner's thing. Um, we have the hand there on page thirteen. I think this is an absolutely critical page. Uh, we have Spinner's grounded. President Mike is running towards Kurogiri now. We know the motivation of like, I'm going to have to take you down because I just can't risk that. And we have the very critical line. It's such a small panel. Okay, I need to actually zoom in here. Sorry, guys. If need be, this was the last resort in the plan to divide and conquer. That is so important. It really pretty much tells you that the heroes know if Kurogiri gets captured here, that's it. We got to switch to plan B. If like, Kurogiri will ruin the entire divide and conquer plan. Like, these guys are already thinking, like, somehow the villains will be able to tell Kurogiri where to go and we're screwed. And this really makes you wonder, like, bro, why didn't you just move him at the last minute with Monoma? Right before everything goes down in, like, the last second, why don't I just move him very quickly with Monoma? And it brings up other questions, and this comes back to the issue with uh, Spinner not running through the doctors, potentially. If Spinner didn't run through the doctors... In the reality where Spinner runs through the doctors, that scene pretty much tells you like, oh my god, wow, this is their like this is it. This is the last line of defense. It's the doctors. There's no one else there to help out. The doctors are pretty much gonna like try and block Spinner from getting to Kurogiri. But in the world where the doctors are just standing off to the side, just blocking the inpatient ward, I have to ask, why is there not just one more doctor with a lethal in injection ready to go? Like if you guys are ready to kill. If, if President Mike is ready to blast Kurogiri into oblivion, why is there not a, a doctor with a lethal injection ready to go? Why is there not one last 
uh, central hospital doctor between Kurugiri and Spinner. Because here's the thinking. Doctor's like, yo, bro, we have to protect our patients. Okay, yeah, that's cool. But if Kurugiri gets out, then you have megalomaniac with dreams of being an energy monopoly all for one on the other side waiting. Um, he might very well shut power to your hospital unless you comply to his demands. And he might very well use the lives of your, uh, of your people on life support as hostages. So would it not make sense to have like two of your doctors out of your crowd of 30 just kind of standing by with Kurugiri? You know, because then, you know, it, what would be really cool there in that scenario is that you could have a moment where the doctors are doing all they can to stop Spinner. And it just really, like, really amps up the feeling of like there's no other choice here. Because uh, when you have this interpretation, what ends up happening is just like it makes the doctors look incompetent. It makes the heroes look incompetent. Um, I don't believe that there was absolutely no one that could be here. You have a crowd of a lot of them standing in front of the inpatient ward. Losing one of those people at these numbers wouldn't be that bad. But having one person in front of Kurogiri maybe ready to kill him in case Spinner gets too close, that's immensely valuable. And remember, Kurogiri is a corpse reanimated and programmed by a dictator. He he runs on uh he runs on like slightly more actually, I was gonna say sophisticated AI, but I'm not too sure it's sophisticated AI. There's not that many moral conundrums here. Anyway, we have President Mike suggesting that the last resort in Divide and Conquer is to make sure they can't reach Kurugiri. But then we have Spinner getting a friendship power up. He stands up, he grabs a hand, and he goes and places it on Kurugiri's head, and that somehow is able to wake him up. Now here is where like things get interesting. We see we see that a lot of Shirakumo's personality is coming out here. We see that we have the band-aid, we have a little bit of an eyeball there. And when he says I am the protector of, Sh of sorry, Tomora Shigaraki, uh, the translator said that he was using the pronouns that Shirakumo uses not the ones that Kurugiri uses. So what the author has done there is that he's put himself in a pretty good position to have a few different things happening. Uh, one is that you have Kurugiri played straight and he just goes to help uh, uh, Shigaraki all for one. One is that you could have Kurugiri go to help Shigaraki, but maybe he's specifically on Shigaraki's side and not on all for one side. Um, therefore, uh, helping... Um, thereby helping Shigaraki get away from all for one which is what I really want because I want people like Toga to ultimately band together with the heroes to try and save Shigaraki from all for one I think that'd be a really cool moment and we have another possibility of Shirakumo being there the entire time and doing some hardcore subterfuge uh, pretending to be Kurogiri to get close enough um, another thing here just to keep in mind is that Shirakumo might be coming in but you got to remember they picked Shirakumo for the Kurugiri base because they wanted someone that was caring. I guess they had a psychological profile for um, Shirakumo before he died. Um, so when you see him talking about being the protector of Tomori Shigaraki, that's pretty much Shirakumo's like core. That's his core beliefs uh, coming out and powering Kurugiri, uh, which could be used towards bad aims. So like you could have just flat out Kurugiri with the sensibilities of Shirakumo going all out to protect Shigaraki. Uh, which could lead into the other things that I've talked about before. Anyway, um, the author has himself on a really good point here. This uh, He has a lot of pivot points here, and he could do something really amazing. I'm very excited to look at the spoilers next. I, I can't wait to see what's going to happen. I, I hope we get a follow-up on this scene. Um, but I, I, I do have questions. Oh, uh, on page 14, we see that we have the storm clouds rolling in, which just might be indicative of where we are in the timeline. This is pretty much roughly when... Uh, Maybe Dobby's evaporating everything. This is pretty much coming close to like when those storm cloud, sorry, when the storm cloud, sorry, when the storm clouds were blowing in. Uh, so yeah, uh, that's just lining up the timeline. But again, with Kurugiri coming out here and Spinner now down on the ground, I just don't see how we can get a second win from All for One with the scream. So I kind of I do agree with White Despair right now at this point. Like I I don't know that those lights meant anything other than a metaphor of people coming together towards one end. Anyway, very excited. Guys, let me know what you thought down below. And uh, till next time, I hope you have an absolutely great day. I'm going to go and read the spoilers right now. Uh, the video will probably be uploaded. Oh, I can't wait.